My thinking on this is at first it's all gravitational, okay? Because it's away from the ground, not moving, so it doesn't have any kinetic energy yet. And then second point, I know I need to divide it up between kinetic energy and gravitational energy. I don't have enough information to know exactly how much to divide it up, but I do know that it's got to be split between the two because it certainly doesn't have as much gravitational energy as it had before because gravitational energy is based on height. So it's at a lower height, but it's moving now, so it has some kinetic energy. Okay. Now this last picture is supposed to be, it's still moving. This is supposed to be a velocity vector here. Um, it's got a lot of speed just before it hits the ground. So pretty much the entire pi should be kinetic energy. And you might argue a really tiny, tiny bit of gravitational energy as well. If you take it to be just the tiniest bit above the ground. Okay. Um, so that's how I would set that one up. If you left off gravitational energy here, I think that makes sense too. We talked a little bit, or you guys read a little bit about dissipated energy also. I probably wouldn't worry about dissipated energy here because something small or falling from a small height probably doesn't have a lot of frictional or air resistance effects. If you wanted to account for it, um, you might include a little bit of energy dissipation between here and here. So I might include a little tiny wedge of dissipated energy. Again, I would say that's optional. You don't really need it. What I would mean by that is as it fell, there was a slight temperature increase because as the ball fell through the air, it collided with air molecules and it sped the, the molecules up a little bit, which would be a temperature increase. Probably not a huge deal here, but in some of the other examples, that becomes more important. So if I have a certain amount of dissipated energy from here to here that I'm showing with this wedge, as it falls even further, the amount of dissipated energy would be a little bit bigger. So the wedge would be a little bit bigger. Again, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to show that, but you could certainly show that if you wanted to account for that small effect. Okay? Questions? All right. So we'll go. All right, so if you would, um, walk us through your thinking here, starting here and moving on to the other three. Well, it's on the string and the, the elastic energy, because, you know, it's like kind of still ready to spring up. So there's some stored energy there in the spring. Yeah, and then like, the second one, we don't really know how much it is, but we just kind of cut it in half. But right, so, so I wouldn't expect you to necessarily have it a 50-50 split. Yeah. You could include it either way. Okay. Um, and then all gravitational, no kinetic energy here at this point because it's not moving. Okay. Um, did anyone include a little bit of gravitational energy in the first picture? Could you make the argument that it has a little bit of gravitational potential energy there? Yeah, it's a little bit above the ground. And again, the thing about gravitational potential energy is that you can always pick your zero point. So I could say I'm measuring from this height in which case what you've drawn is just fine. If it's not above that height, you might say that it doesn't have any gravitational potential energy. So really, again, that's where we have to be a little bit flexible in these. As long as you're thinking about it properly, you're fine. OK? Okay, walk us through your thinking here. So it has a lot of kinetic energy to begin with because it's moving out, but it still has some. Uh, so that would be here, moving pretty fast. Yeah. 
But if you're measuring from the ground, it does certainly have some gravitational energy. That's good. It what about does, middle? It, it doesn't move when it gets to the top because it's zero. Okay. And then uh, it's coming back down, so it has a uh, kinetic energy again. It still has some potential. Right. So if I compare the first to the third, the gravitational energy you've shown a little bit bigger, which it should be because it's a little bit higher from the ground, which would mean the kinetic energy is smaller at that point, which makes sense because it's speeding up as it falls. Um, some people see this one and they include a little wedge of kinetic energy here. Why might that be a good idea? If you, yeah, if you threw it with any bit of horizontal motion, right, we know about projectiles that they move steadily from left to right. So there would be a little bit of a velocity vector here at the top, which means it has a little bit of speed. It's coming back down at an angle here. So if you thought that it was thrown straight upward, you probably wouldn't include that. But if you thought it was thrown with any bit of arc at all, you should probably have, even at the peak, a tiny bit of kinetic energy. OK? All right, so number four, we have a ball bouncing. The things that I'm thinking about when I start is that it doesn't bounce to the same height. So I know there has to be some dissipated energy here. Um, I did take this one to be a straight downward drop, even though the picture kind of shows a little bit of sideways motion. So I'm not going to worry about any lateral motion here. I'm just going to say it, it essentially is dropped downward. It bounces back to a little bit less height on the second bounce. So I started again with all gravitational energy, because it doesn't have any motion to start if I think it's a straight downward drop. The second one, it's supposed to look kind of compressed, like squished, OK? And if you think about why a ball bounces, when it gets compressed, it's going to spring back. So what I did for the second picture is said mostly elastic potential energy. That should be E, EL. But I did include a wedge of dissipated energy. Now, the reason I did that is if you think about what happens when a ball bounces, um, first of all, it's going to create some vibrations, right? It's going to make some sound. And that would be, you could lump that under dissipated energy because the particle motion, the vibrations, are going to be more than they were before that happened, OK? The other thing I was thinking of is when you flex something, even something that springs back, if you do it a lot, you'll notice a temperature increase. So I'm thinking, OK, when this thing flexes a little bit, it's actually increasing its temperature a little bit. The surface, because it got uh, impacted and it's probably vibrating a little bit more, there would be a temperature increase. And that's how I'm using dissipated energy here to account for all of that additional particle motion um, that came from somewhere. And really, it came from the initial gravitational energy that this ball had. So when it bounces back, I would make sure that the dissipated energy wedge is the same or maybe even slightly bigger because I think you could argue as it moves up, it's interacting with air molecules and making those move a little bit faster. But really what I would be looking for is that dissipated energy is still present in my diagram because you never get the dissipated energy back. It increases temperature somewhere and, and that never comes back to a useful form. And then because it's at its peak, I would say it's the rest is gravitational. Okay? So that helps explain why I never get back to the same height. I never get to the same gravitational potential energy because some of that initial um, total of energy has now been dissipated to really particle motion rather than the organized motion of the ball as it falls and bounces. Okay? Questions on that? Is that thermal? Yes. Okay. Thermal. Okay. <laughs> All right. So explain what's going on here. All right. So at first, the, the box is sliding. 
and you can see in the diagram that it's obviously coming to a stop. So um, at first, it's got a lot of kinetic energy. It's going pretty fast, but we had to put thermal energy in the first slide there because it's slowing down in the second slide. And then the thermal energy is just, it's getting larger and larger because it's coming straight to a stop. Good. So let me ask, could we put thermal energy in all of these? We could, right? Because there's always particle motion, even in a solid. As long as it's above absolute zero, there's particle motion. So what you've done here is fine. You've kind of shown something that we didn't show in the other ones because it wasn't important before. Okay. The key is, is that this thermal energy wedge gets bigger in each case, right? It's bigger here, and then in the end, all of that kinetic energy that we had from the organized motion of the block sliding has really been converted to particle motion, a, a temperature increase. And we know temperature increases really do happen when things rub together due to friction. So that's exactly how I would explain it. Now, another alternative way you could do this, OK, because we always have some thermal energy present in the first picture, we kind of assume it's in the background. So another way we could have represented this is said, it was all kinetic at first. Yes, I know there's thermal energy there, but I'm not going to worry about representing that. And then if, instead of showing a thermal energy wedge getting bigger, you could just start to show an increasingly larger thermal en or, I'm sorry, dissipated energy wedge. Okay. What we really mean by dissipated energy is the change in thermal energy. Right? So it's the thermal energy increase due to frictional effects or vibrations or anything that's happening to account for that change in energy that's more visible, like the kinetic energy of the block sliding. In that case, I would probably, instead of just saying it's all thermal, which is correct, I would say it's all dissipated. And the way I interpret that is all of that kinetic energy that I had from the block moving is now kind of trapped in particle motion. It was a thermal energy increase that occurred due to friction. Okay, so I'm trying to get at the point. You know, there are different ways to think about this. Um, both ways are perfectly valid. Um, the dissipated energy just takes into effect the change in thermal energy that happens. Okay. All right. Number six. Okay, so walk us through this one. Well, it's the uh, first instance the uh, clay is not moving yet, so there's no kinetic energy present. But in the second one, since it's moving, it's losing its potential energy and gaining the kinetic. Okay, and again, we don't know necessarily that it's a 50-50 split. We just know it's split somewhat between the two. And then once it hits the ground, it loses that energy and uh, it uh, becomes dissipated. Right, so we kind of assume, again, dissipated energy is kind of a catch-all. When it hits, it probably created some sound, right? So there were some vibrations there that weren't there before. If you've ever taken a piece of clay and, like, kneaded it and worked it and smushed it, it actually does get warmer, right? Smush, that's a scientific word. Um, so even, you know, when this just smacks on the ground, if it's deformed at all, it's going to increase its temperature. Probably not a noticeable amount, but if you had a, you know, a sensitive enough piece of equipment, you could probably measure it. So again, all of that organized gravitational and kinetic energy went to dis uh, dissipated or disorganized uh, particle motion, thermal energy increases, really. OK. Questions on that? OK, good. Thank you. All right, for this last one. I'm looking at this and seeing the word constant speed, OK? So I'm thinking my kinetic energy is constant, OK? I also made the assumption that this was not a friction-free world, OK? So there's some frictional effects, meaning that I'm going to have dissipated energy that increases as time goes on. And so I know I need to account for those two things. So what I did was just kind of arbitrarily picked an amount of kinetic ener energy. 
that I knew needed to be constant in each picture. And that's because it's described as constant speed. Okay, that's a given. Again, if I want to account for frictional effects and dissipated energy, from the time I go from here to here, I've dissipated some energy. There's frictional effects, something increased in temperature, and I would include that with a wedge that I'm going to call dissipated energy. And again, I never get that energy back, so my next dissipated energy wedge has to be at least that big and actually bigger. So if you're in a car driving down the highway with your cruise control on, you're dissipating energy that entire time. Something is heating up. Particles are moving faster than they were before. But that leaves me this unnamed wedge, which got smaller in each picture. What are you thinking? Um, the thermal is, again, kind of there in the background. And the thermal energy is increasing throughout. That's how I've shown the dissipated energy wedge. Remember, the dissipated energy wedge is really accounting for the change in thermal energy. What am I losing, though? Thermal energy is actually going up. What do you have to do to even just move at constant speed when friction is present? You've got to burn some fuel, right? Okay. So in this case, we haven't included this in any other example, but I would think we should include chemical energy to help explain where that dissipated energy went. Okay, so E chem, getting smaller and smaller in each case. If I was in a friction-free world, I wouldn't need to burn any fuel, right? I could just get up to speed, and my own inertia would carry me at a steady speed. But when I have air resistance and frictional effects in the engine, I actually have to burn some fuel just to overcome those frictional effects, which is kind of weird to think about that. But when, you're go you know, when you have cruise control set, the fuel that you're burning is just to overcome frictional effects. You're not actually increasing your speed at all, right? So you're not gaining kinetic energy. You're just not losing kinetic energy, right? You're overcoming all those frictional effects that would otherwise slow you down, okay?